All right, well, good morning to everyone and welcome to The Well here at STSA. I'm so excited that you're joining. We have a fantastic Sunday, fantastic message for you. So if you're here in Arlington, thank you so much for being here. If you're in Leesburg, thank you for joining us this morning, wherever it is that you're watching from. We're happy that you're here on this final Sunday of uh, final message, I should say, of 2021. And we have an extraordinary, we always say The Well is an extraordinary place where or an ordinary place where extraordinary things happen, and we have an extraordinary message. And because of that, I want to start today with an extraordinary joke. All right, so here we go. A priest, a minister, and a rabbi were walking outside a bar. Okay, you watching that one? Okay, because of... So a Catholic priest, a Baptist minister, and a Jewish rabbi were walking outside a bar one day. It was a motorcycle bar. And as they were walking, they started chatting amongst themselves, and they started to get into the discussion of who is the best at preaching? Because that's what we preachers do. We kind of, you know, we do the humble thing in front of y'all, but when we're with each other, we're kind of flexing our muscles. So each of them said, I'm the best. They said, no, I'm the best. No, I'm the best. So they came up with a little wager. They were each going to go into this bar, this motorcycle bar with all these big, strong, you know, mo motorcycle guys with the tattoos and the zippers and the jackets and the whatnot. And they were going to each see if they could convert one person to their faith. The Catholic priest goes in. He comes out 10 minutes later and he's got his arm around a guy, a big muscular motorcycle guy. Okay, and he gives him a hug and he sends him on his way. So the other two ask him, how did it go? He said, success. They said, what'd you do? He said, I told him about the church and the sacraments and the tradition. And I talked about the Pope and he said he believed. And they said, okay, that was great. Then what? He said, I told the guy, it's God's will for you to get baptized. And he got baptized on the spot. He said, okay, that's great. Next goes the Baptist minister. He goes inside. 10 minutes later, he comes out. Again, he's got his arm around a guy and he gives him a hug and he sends him on his way. And they said, what happened? He said, success. He said, I preached to the guy about the scriptures and I talked to him about faith and I talked to him about repentance and the guy accepted it. So I told him it's God's will for you to repent and believe on the spot. So he did and he accepted and he repented and he believed on the spot, success. Then the Jewish rabbi goes in. 10 minutes later, he comes out. But he's not got his arm around anyone else. He's actually, his face is all bruised up. Looks like he's gotten like into a fight of some sort. He's got scratches and cuts on his face. And they said, what happened? They said, no one believed your message? He said, no, they loved my message. I talked to them about the Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and about how the, the history of the Jewish people, how we're a special people of God but I just wish that I hadn't said it was God's will for him to get circumcised on the spot. Uh, welcome to part two in our series, Finding My Way to His Will, where we are talking about the most important question in the world, which is, what is God's will? And how do I know God's will? And just to show you how much the question is important to us, even as I was preparing to come up here on the stage, just five minutes ago, I was sitting there reviewing my notes and someone came to me and said, hey, Father Anthony, I want to ask you a question real quick. I said, yeah, but quick, I got to go up. He said, I just need to know real quick. I, need, I have this situation. How do I know what God wants me to do? I said, have a seat, son. Okay, because that's exactly what we're talking about here today because it's the number one most common question that people want to know is what's God's will for my life? What's God's will for my job? What's God's will for my relationships? And the problem is, is we approach God's will <clears throat> As, as I said last week, as if it's a mystery that is unsolvable. We approach it like it's Indiana Jones with the quest for the Holy Grail. We approach it as if God is trying to hide it from us and we have to jump through a series of clues and find answers to riddles in order to only the elite of the elite can find God's will. But what I told you last week, the key thought of this series is this, is that I have to want, well, that's not what I said, the key thought. Okay, that's okay. What I said, the key thought last week, I didn't get the right slide up there. The key thought is, is that God didn't mean his will to be a mystery. God's will is not meant to be a mystery. God actually, fathers understand this. Okay, moms too, but we talk about God as our father. God wants to reveal his will to us. His desire to reveal it is greater than our desire to find it. And you have to believe that, that God is not playing hide and seek with you that God is not playing a game and only like good luck to like catch me if you can. God's desire to reveal his will to you in every situation, I promise you, 
is greater than your desire even to receive it. That's what this series is based on. The problem in discovering God's will is not on God's end, but it's on our end. And that's what we're talking about. Last week, we started by looking at what's the wrong way to approach God's will today. We'll look at the right way. Quick recap of what we talked about last week. We said the first, the starting point is an intellectual, it's an understanding. It's making sure that we understand how God's will works. And we talked about, if you remember, like if you were here last week, the soccer goal. If you have a soccer field and there's a goal on one end of the field, that's God's will for my life. But you don't just say, where's the goal? First, you start off by make sure you're on the field, the right field, because if you're standing on a baseball field, you never find the soccer goal. Or if you're standing on a football field, you got to make sure you're on the right field. And then you got to make sure you're on the right half of the field. So we talked about first God's sovereign will. And the sovereign will of God, nothing happens outside the will of God. God is doing something at all times in this world. And the only one who's going to find the personal will of God, the specific will of God, first has to start with what is God doing in the universe? What is God doing in my universe? And what is God doing in the world? And we have to accept God's sovereign will for our life. That gets us on the field. But then the second step is God's moral will. And we talked about how there's a lot of things that God allows as part of his sovereign will, but they're certainly not part of the moral will of God. Okay, and I talked about Judas, for example, was allowed on the field, but clearly not the the moral will of God because he he, he clearly was, was acting unethically and he was betraying Christ. So the moral will of God is the field, the offensive side, not the defensive side, the offensive side. And you're never gonna get to the personal will of God without accepting God's sovereign will. And then two, without obeying God's moral will. So that's what we talked about last week. We also talked about three things, <clears throat> three reasons why we struggle to find that goal. And we said, number one, we don't ask. And we talked last week about asking and asking not once or twice, but asking consistently. We said, number two, we don't listen, or rather we listen, we hear what we want to hear. We hear what we want to hear. You can make God's voice sound like whatever. God's voice surprisingly sounds a lot like my voice. Sounds surprisingly a lot like what I want to do. When it's like, what does God want me to do? Oh, God wants me to sit and watch football all day. Because again, like I told you last week, it's on Sunday, his day off, my day off, win-win. So we can make God's voice sound a lot like our own voice. So number one, we don't ask. Number two, we don't listen or we only hear what we want to hear. And then number three, we rely too much on logic. And I told you all last week, I'm not against logic. I'm pro-logic and God is pro-logic. But there's a difference between using logic and relying on logic. And God doesn't want us to rely on logic because God is above logic. He's not against logic. He is above it. That was all last week. If you missed it, go online, get caught up, because really today is is based on the foundation we talked about last week. You need both messages together, so please make sure you get caught up. Today, though, let's talk about that soccer goal. Last week, what not to do. Today, we're going to talk about what to do, how to get to God's personal will. And last week, I want to pick up today where where I left off last week. Last week, at the very end, I said that the key is our desire, not technique. Desire, not technique. So often, when it comes to the will of God, what, what book in the Bible should I read? Like, what prayer should I say? Like, what, 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 what do I need to do in the morning? And what do I do on, like, we worry so much about the technique, the details. And what I told you is 90% of God's will is desire, 10% is technique. We spend 90% of our time focused on technique and only 10% on the desire. And that's why we're missing out so much. It's more desire than it is technique. That's why when Jesus spoke about hearing God's voice, what did he say? He said, ask, help me out here. Ask and you shall receive. He didn't say technique. He just said, ask, desire. He said, seek and you will find. He said, knock and it will be open to you. We also looked at that verse in Jeremiah, which says, you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. He didn't talk about technique. He talked about desire. And the verse that we ended with, Hebrews eleven six, 6, it talked about how he is a rewarder of those who blank seek him. What's that blank? It begins with a D. Diligently seek him. He is a rewarder of those who diligently, he doesn't talk about technique. He doesn't talk about which psalm to say or which church to go to or what question to ask. He says, the one who seeks me sincerely from all their heart will figure out the technique. We'll figure out how to hear the voice. But that's the starting point. Now, what I want to do today is kind of pick up from there. And I never want to say God's will is a formula. I'm I'm very hesitant to say that. Like, I don't want to ever say that God's will is, yes, one plus two plus three, you get God's will. Because that's what we kind of want. We want to just dumb it down to just like a formula in the end. I don't believe that. But what 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 I want to do is to make it a little bit practical is I want to paint a picture. Not a formula. There's a difference between, to me, a formula and a picture. A picture of what my life 
should look like and will look like when I am truly hearing God's voice, my life will look like this. And I want to paint that picture for you. And it's very simple. It's going to sound so simple that you're going to say, yeah, it's obvious. But stick with me because by the end of the day, it might not be as obvious as you think. And that is this, is that I have to want God's will more than my will. I have to want God's will more than my will. Let's take a step back for a second here, break this, try to understand what this sentence means. Every single one of us is born with a free will. And because you have a free will, you can say the following sentence. I want blank. Because you were given a will. You can say, I want a sandwich. Say, I want a salad. Say, I want a taco. Say, I want a burrito. You can say, I want. You can say, I want to go to school. You can say, I want to drop out of school. We hope you don't say that, but you may say that. You can say, I want to be a doctor. You can say, I want to skip the doctor. I just want to marry a doctor. Like you can say whatever it is that you want because each one of us is born with a will and the ability to say, I want. Where did that ability to say, I want come from? Where did that will come from? Because not all creation has it. We actually, it's actually unique to us. You know why we have it? You and I have it because you and I were made in the image of God. We were made in the image of our creator. And our creator made us in his image, meaning he has a will and he gave us the ability to have a will. So the same way I can say, I want X, he also says, I want. He also says, there's things that I desire. And most of them, and when it comes to our relationship with him, I want you to do this. I want there to be this. Now, for the most part, I want to say 90%, because I truly believe it's 90%. 90% of what I want and God wants, 90% are the same. I believe that. Because both of us would say, I want peace. Anybody not want peace? Anybody say, I like fighting? Both of us would say, I want love. Both of us would say, I want no murder. I want no stealing. I want no lying. I want no racism. I want no gossiping. I want no sleeping during sermons. Like we can agree on certain like, essential components of humanity. We can both say, I, I don't know if God would say this, but I would imagine the gas prices, like we want those things to go down. Like everyone wants the same thing on all those things. So 90% of the time, I want, God wants, same page. But it's not 100%. Are there things, can you think of, that God might say, I want, that you would say, I don't want? How about, for example, God says, I want, turn the cheek. You say, no, I don't want. God says, I want, forgive. You say, mm. God would say, I want, do not look lustfully. We would say, we agree most of the time. There's a lot of things that God would say, I want, that we did say, I don't, and, and vice versa. There's a lot of things we might say, I want, that God would say, no, I don't want. And this is, the, this is the essence of discovering God's will, is what do you do when I want conflicts with God wants? When my I want and God's I want, when those two are at conflict with each other. I would say, if you had to characterize, now I'm talking about that 10% where we diverge, the I want versus the God wants. I would say this that my will is characterized by two things. My comfort and pursuit of happiness. God's will is characterized by my character and pursuit of holiness. I want comfort, God wants character. I want my life to be easy, God wants me to be better. And we, especially in America, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that's all us. Well, God says, life, I'm with you. Liberty, I'm all about it. The pursuit of holiness. And what do you do when these two diverge? We're gonna look at two examples real quick here. We're gonna draw the two extremes. I always like to draw the extremes so that way no one feels judged or guilty. You're somewhere in between the, the plus 100 to the minus 100, somewhere in between. Let's start with the minus. Who is on the furthest extreme of not agreeing with God's will and doing the opposite of God's will? We would say devil. Okay, who's on the positive side? Jesus, okay? You always go right on the extremes. You go, Jesus, devil. Okay, Jesus, devil. Okay, so let's go devil and let's see, was there ever a time when the devil, his will conflicted with God's will? And the answer is yes. We know that the devil was not created as the devil. He was created as Lucifer, okay, as, the, as an angel of light. 
And when he was created as an angel of light, there came a point in time where his I will conflicted with God's I will. We'll read it here in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 14. It says, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations, for you have said in your heart. Now listen to what Lucifer says in his heart. Listen carefully to the words that he uses that are repeated over and over. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Lucifer, Satan, I will, I will, I will, I will, I want, I want, I want. Lucifer was made to serve God. But he had his own idea of how it should look like. And he convinced himself that God's I want wasn't in his best interest. That God actually had a wrong I want. That God's I want was not in my best interest. Or maybe not that smart. Or maybe not that, that well thought out. God's I want, no thank you. I'm going to go with what I want, I want. And in the end, the result of him choosing his own I want was he lost everything. He went from the top at the top, doesn't get much better than being an angel in heaven, around the throne of God, and he went down to being the devil. He lost everything because of this one thing, I want versus God's want. Contrast that with Jesus, Matthew chapter 26, verse 39, on the night of his arrest before he was about to be uh, crucified. It says in Matthew 26, 39, he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed saying, oh my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but you will. See the difference? One said, I know what you will, but I will this. And the other one said, I will this, but I know what you will. So let's go with your thing. And I'm telling you, life comes down to a battle between these two forces, all of life, all of life. I don't want to overly simplify, but this is all of life. This is all of your life. This is all of my life. A battle between my will, and let's say it like Jesus said it, thy will. Between my will and thy will. Between my I want and God's I want. And the question is, what do you do when these two are in conflict with each other? Let me give you the punchline up front and then we'll break it down. The punchline is this, is that we think that when I let go of my want, of the I want, that my life is going to stink. And the truth of the matter is the exact opposite. That it's only when I let go of I want and I say, I got no more I want. I'm going to go with what you say I want. That's when we get what we want. And that's when we get the beauty and all the good stuff. Seems like the opposite, I know. Because you would say, most people in this room, most people watching, even Leesburg or online, wherever it is that you're watching, most of us would say that the worst parts of my life are where I don't get what I want. Most of us would say that. That the problem is that I don't have my want. That God is not cooperating with my want. That's what we think. But stick with me here today. And I want to show you that it couldn't be further from the truth. That it's actually when you have exactly what you want. That's the worst part of your life. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go from one extreme to the other. I remember where I said Lucifer was. Let's say, let's say Lucifer was on that extreme. We said Jesus on that. Actually, I did the opposite. Let's say Lucifer that extreme. Jesus on that extreme. We're going to march our way through. And we're going to talk about that's where we want to get. Okay, where Jesus was, where he said, I want your will more than my will. I'm acknowledging I have a will. I want this. Let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. That's the answer. Now let's, we all start here and we kind of work our way here. So what I'm going to do is talk about stages along the way. And I believe there's kind of three stages along the way. And the fact that you're sitting here today in this room means that you're already ahead of the bad guy. You're already ahead of Lucifer. You're already on the track to say, I want God's will. Especially in the beginning when I said, who wants to know the answer to God's will? We all kind of said it, but now we made it a little bit more complicated. So we're all somewhere. Let's go phase one, phase two, phase three. I think we all go through these phases at some point in our life. And the goal is just keep on moving. Phase number one is I want what I want and I want it right now. I want what I want and I want it right now. If you have a two-year-old or a three-year-old or you are a two-year-old or a three-year-old, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's the temper tantrum phase. It's the worst of humanity. When it's a two-year-old, it's okay. We expect it from a two-year-old. But some of us, we gotta be honest, our maturity level isn't much better. This is the worst part of humanity. 
Ever since the fall of mankind, there are two things that characterize mankind ever since the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. The two things are number one, selfishness, and number two, arrogance. These are the two problems of humanity. Selfishness, me first, every problem in the world, its root is I want this, it's something about me, not caring about anybody else, it's selfishness and arrogance. Arrogance meaning I know best. I'm smarter than anybody else. Anyone else is dumb who tells me otherwise. If you take someone who is selfish and who is arrogant, and then you add on top of that, that image of God stuff that I said earlier, which gives him the ability to make plans and to do things of his own will, you have a bad combination, and that's what you have today. Let's make it a little bit more closer to home, especially as we approach the Christmas season. <clears throat> this is, I want a new car. Okay, but we can't afford a new car. I want a new car. Okay, but Christmas is coming. We got to get gifts for the kids and we got to, I want a new car. It's not wise right now to get a new car. It's been very expensive. Put some duct tape on the old one. We'll get a new one when prices go. I want a new car means I want a new car. I want to get married. Okay, but there, I want to get married now. Okay, but there's no, I'm going to get married now. The next sucker who walks through that door who has a pulse, that's my guy. I want what I want right now. I want this job. I want to sleep in on Sunday. I don't want to say I'm sorry. I don't want to go over there. I don't want to see that. Like, this is who we are, humanity at its worst. And some of us, if we're honest, we're kind of operating this way. What we do as humanity, again, the arrogance plus the selfishness, we throw a dart, okay? And we say, boom, that's the bullseye. That's where I want to get to. That is what is good for me. And even if all of heaven and earth says, no, that's not what's good for you. Once I decide that's what's good, remember when Adam and Eve fell, what tree did they eat from? They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So they became the determiners of what's good and evil. Before that, it was God who said, no, that's not good. That's good. That's what you need to do. You need to go there. After the fall, no, I want that. That's good. I'm going to get that. Nothing's going to stop me. And I'm going to throw some Bible verses in there, sprinkle it in there. I'll throw a prayer in there. I'll come to church. I'll ask Father Anthony to say a prayer. Boom. <clears throat> now, if this is where you're worried that you are in this state, let me give you some encouragement here. You can take heart here because we all start in this state. And in fact, there are some giants of faith who display these exact characteristics. And look no further than the first giant of faith, the man of faith, Abraham himself. Abraham was a godly man who married a godly woman named Sarah. They wanted a child. God didn't give them a child. And they said, I want a child. And God said, there ain't no child right now. And they said, I want what I want, and I want it right now. They took matters into their own hands. Genesis chapter 16, verse 1 and 2. So Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abram, see now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. That should be the end of the story. God's want was no children right now. But look how it keeps going. So please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And, Abr and Abram heeded the voice of Sarah. It should have stopped after that middle piece that God said, I want no children right now. But what they said is, God wants, no thank you, I want. And we gave God a chance to do what we wanted. He didn't do it. So we took matters into our old hands, our own hands. And I got to believe that Abram and Sarah knew what they were doing was wrong. I got to believe it their relationship with God. They had to know what they were doing was wrong, but their I want was just so strong. Their I want was so strong, end up leading them to all kinds of problems. So that's number one. That's the world today is that I want what I want and I want it right now. Pursuit of comfort, pursuit of happiness at all costs. If it's a two-year-old, we get it. But then what we hope is that two-year-old matures by the time they get to four, five, six, that they can see outside of their own comfort and outside their own selfishness. We hope that they mature, and we hope the same spiritually. And that will get us to step phase two, which is I want what God wants, but I want what God wants. And I believe that the people who are in this phase are very sincere, like you're honest when you say, I want what God wants, but you know what it is? It's like the fine print. You know the fine print? or it's like the prerequisites. It's like, for sure, I want what God wants, but there's always like the back of the, of, of, of the agreement that you sign with the little fine print with the escape clauses. 
okay, which talk about the different caveats. I want what God wants, but I need to be married by this time. Anything between now and then, I want exactly what God wants, but if I'm not married by then, I want what God wants as long as I have this salary. No problem. As long as I have this salary, I want exactly what God wants. I want what God wants as long as he doesn't want this. So yeah, God, whatever you want, but it can't be that. So anything other than that, I want what you want. This is a hybrid between my will and thy will, which is God, if you A, then I B. But if you don't A, then I don't B. So really, God, it's kind of on you. Your call. I'm good either way. <laughs> this phase works for a little. You can, get, you can get to a certain level of spirituality with this phase of I want what, I, what God wants, but. But at a certain point in time, it's like the person who's standing with one foot on this boat, one foot on this boat. You can stay on both boats for a time, but there comes a point in time, I ain't gonna go any further than this, okay? Because we might not get back up, all right? That there comes a certain point in time where those two boats diverge and you have to make a decision. And the story that comes to my mind is from Mark chapter 10. One time Jesus met a rich young man and this rich young man said to himself and said to Jesus, I want what you want, God. And at the beginning, we didn't think there was anything, but as the story went on, we found out that there was a but associated with his desire. Mark chapter 10, verse 21 through 22. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way. Sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come take up the cross. He didn't lose any of his possessions, did he? No, Jesus didn't like rob him and say like, I'm taking your, so he came with a bunch of possessions. He left with those same possessions. So why was he sad? What did he lose? Think about it. He lost something. He lost the ability to live in both wills at the same time. His whole life, he had convinced himself that I want what God wants, but, but I also want what I want. And he lived his whole life. I want what God wants. I want what God wants as long as I have these riches. But then what Jesus took away, Jesus didn't touch his riches, but Jesus took, his, took away his ability to live in both worlds at the same time, said, you gotta choose. You want what I want or you want what you want? Because you can no more have both. The boats have started to spread. And that's why if you look at the beginning of this story, okay, verse 17, you'll see that his desire was sincere. It said, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? You see, this young man was sincere. Jesus didn't come to him. He came to Jesus and he didn't even walk to Jesus. He ran to him, said, I want what you want. I want your will. I'm here to serve you. I'm 100% yours. But deep inside, there was this little, but as long as you don't. What I'm about to say, I'm going to say it in all love. I'm about to say it in all love. And with all respect, you have a butt too. And some of you have a little butt be hidden. Some of you have a big butt. And for some of you, it is your big butt that is stopping you from all the good things that God desires for your life. Your butt is causing you to miss out on what Jesus is talking about. We're talking about eye has not seen, ear has not heard, and has come upon the heart of man, things which God has pr prepared for those who love him. Your butt is stopping you from that. And it's time to trim that big butt. Maybe even to lose it all together. Because it's getting in the way. And it may be stopping you from the very thing that you desire most. The very thing. Like I want you to think to yourself, I don't know you, I don't know you, I don't know anybody. But all I'm saying is think to yourself, the thing that you desire most, what are the chances that your butt is actually stopping you from getting it. Give examples of butts, that'd probably get me in a lot of trouble. Okay. <laughs> but I would say that oftentimes our butts are those things that we desire, that we think are best for us. Like I wanna show you this verse again that I just showed you a minute ago. And as you look at it, I want you to read the same verse, but in light of what I just said about how the butts may be stopping you from the good thing. I want you to read it again.
in heaven. And you will have what? Say it again. You will have? I can't hear you in Leesburg. Everyone say it all together. You will have? Listen here. This guy's butt stopped him from getting what? Treasure in heaven. Man, you came and you showed up and you said, how do I get eternal life? How do I just enter heaven? And Jesus said, I don't want you just to enter. I want to give you treasure. But the guy couldn't see it. The guy couldn't because of his But Very good. It's fun to say in church, isn't it? It's fun to say it in church. Okay. I'll just leave you with this thought and we're going to move on because my time is, is running out here. It is scary to think how many things we are missing out on because of our butt. It is scary to think how many things you and I are missing out on. How many, let's go Christmas since it's the Christmas season, how many unopened presents are sitting under the tree with our name on it and we're missing out on it. Why? Because I want what God wants. But... That's why we want to move to phase three. Phase three is this. I want what God wants, period. This is what we're trying to get to. I want what God wants, period. End of story. I'm in. Sold out. No discussion. I am all in to this Jesus thing. I am all into God's will. I am all into, you know what? I tried my will, and I speak from experience on this one. I always say the worst place to be in life is fully in control of your life, perfectly according to your will. I promise you, that is the worst place to be in life. I tried it. I've been in control. And I'm telling you, I'm in. God, my want, I don't want it anymore. I want whatever you want. I may not understand it. I may not like it necessarily in the short term, but I am all in. And believe it or not, that's the meaning of being a disciple of Jesus. Matthew chapter 16. Jesus said to his disciples, verse 24, if anyone desires to disciple. I'm a Christian. Well, do you know that according to Jesus, the head of the whole Christianity business, the head of the whole operation, he says, well, this is the defining characteristic. Someone who is a follower of me will deny himself, will deny his wants, will deny what I want and what my plan, and will say, you know what deny means? Like, think of it like, like I'm a citizen of the United States of America, but let's say I'm a citizen of like, you know, uh, uh, Canada. Okay, so you know what to be? I don't know if this is true or not, but if I want to be a citizen of America, I have to deny my Canadian citizenship to accept my American citizenship. I don't know if that's actually true or not, but just go with me. I'm sure there's countries where that is true. Well, the Germans, okay, it's got to be the Germans. Yeah, exactly. So it's exactly what Jesus is saying right here, is if you want to say, I want God, I want your want, you got to deny the I want, but you can't have both. You can't have two captains on the boat. You can't have two people who are saying, I want, I want, because there's going to come a point in time, 90% of the time, you can operate this way, but there's going to come that 10% where the two I wants are conflicting. And then what happens? Who's calling the shots? Who's really the captain on the boat? And what Jesus is saying is, you want my I want? Got to get rid of your I want. That's why I say it this way, as blunt as possible, to be a follower of Jesus I must deny myself, a.k.a. my will. I must deny myself. I must deny my will. And if you ask me, again, nobody get offended by this. I'm talking in generality. I'm not saying this particular church. I'm saying the church these days, what I see. This is like the number one missing point of this whole, the, the church today. We think of the church today, again, not us. We think of the church today, that being a member of the church, being a Christian, means I just say a prayer every now and then. I go to church every now and then. I believe in Christmas and Easter. That makes me a Christian. Yeah, and I have a Bible somewhere in my house. I pull it out every now and then. I put a little money in the money box, help old ladies across the street. I'm a Christian. That's not what Christian means. Who told you that? Who gave you the idea that Christianity was something that was just, you know, just like something you just sprinkle on your life? Because the founder of Christianity, Jesus, said that the definition of Christianity, follower, it's someone who says, I don't want what I want. I want what you want. And the guys who were the first ones on the Christian boat, the apostles, the disciples, anyone who joined the church in the first century, when it says that you deny yourself and you hate your life, do you know why Jesus said that? 
that you got to be prepared to hate your life. Like we look at today and like spiritualize it or symbolic or just means like, yeah, I, I, I turn off Netflix every now and then. I hate my life. Like what? we, I don't know how we define it. Or I give up a cup of coffee to put a little money in the poor box. And yeah, look at me. I'm de- That's not, you know, the people in the first century to become a Christian didn't mean that they would spiritually lose their life or symbolically. It meant literally. Because in the first century, if you became a Christian, number one, you're probably going to lose your job. Think about that just for one second. If your decision to come to church today meant you may lose your job tomorrow. It's unthinkable for us in our society, but there's people in the world that's that way. And it certainly was that way back in the first century. That once you became a Christian, you risk losing your job. You certainly risk losing your family. And if you ain't got no job and you got no family, you're going to be in trouble. And in some places at certain times, you're going to lose your life. Not like maybe, like probably. And you just compare that to the way we look at it. We think the sacrifices, I had to get up early on a Sunday. I had to get up. Father Anthony, I made a big sacrifice. I got here at 9.15 today. I'm lo- I am denying myself. Let me show you a scary verse. Titus 1.16 says this. Works, they deny him. I don't want to be the Grinch that stole Christmas. But as we close up here, I want to ask you to ask yourself a question. Where is it that you stand on this issue of I, my will versus thy will? Of my I want versus God's I want? Be honest. You don't got to answer to me. I don't care what your answer is. You got to answer anyone else. You got to answer to yourself. You got to answer in front of God. At the beginning, I said, we all want to know how to know God's will. I want God's will. Tell me God's will. Well, I just gave you the answer. The answer to knowing God's will is simple. Is you say, I don't want my own will. I want God's will more than my will. And if you can honestly, honestly, sincerely say that, listen carefully to me, you will have no problem discerning the will of God for your life. If you can honestly say it is not what I want, God, I want what you want. You will have no problem discerning the will of God for your life. I'm not saying every second, but I'm saying in a macro sense, you will have no problem because God is on our side. This is not a game. This is not hide and seek. This is not God trying to trick us. This is God saying, I'm your father. I am the good father. I am the good shepherd. The shepherd, the sheep don't have to bribe the shepherd to tell him the will. The shepherd's not like, guess where the water is today? Wrong. Gotcha. The shepherd's greatest, like his purpose of his existence is to take the sheep from where they are to the water, to the safe place, to the place where there's pasture. That's his greatest desire. But all he needs is that dumb little sheep to say, okay, you know what? Let's go with your thing, shepherd, not my thing. Like I think here, like the cliff looks nice, but let's go with your thing because you have a track record. And I'm going to take your I want. Ask yourself, is that where you're at? Make it more practical. We talked about several characters today. Ask yourself which of these characters sounds like you. We started with Lucifer. Lucifer said, it's my will. I don't care about his will. I will do what I want. I will, I will, I will. I don't care about him. I don't think anyone here is in that boat. Next, we talked about Abraham. Abraham said, I kind of want God's will, but I tried it, didn't really work out. So I'm taking matters into my own hands. God, it's your fault if it doesn't work out. I gave you a chance. You didn't do it. We talked about the rich young ruler who said, I want God's will. I want the kingdom of God. I want to do the right thing, but only if, only if he lets me keep all my stuff. Only if he doesn't touch this. Only if he doesn't ask me about this. Only if he doesn't tell me to give up this. I want what God wants, but only if. And then we looked at Jesus Christ, who said, Father, let this cup pass through me. I want. Nevertheless, not what I want, what you want. And what you want is hard. And what you want, listen carefully. Jesus, like, I, this is like the best verse in the Bible. The best verse. Thank God it was recorded in the scripture that Jesus said, I don't want that. But if you want it, I want it. This is life. 
This is where we're trying to aim at to get to. Life comes down to who you trust. My will or his will. My I want or his I want. My brain, my plan, or his. If you read the Bible, there are no shortage, there is no shortage of promises about all the good things that God has in store for us, especially these days, as we're about to celebrate Christmas in a few days. And all of Christmas is good tidings and glad tidings and merry gentlemen and all kinds of good stuff. Because Christmas, the salvation, the goodness, the kindness, the mercy, like all the good things of God, open any page of the Bible and you will find promise after promise after promise after promise of good things that God has in store for you. Peace, love, joy, hope, riches, glory, inheritance. There is no shortage of promises. But every one of those promises is based on one thing. Every one of those promises is based on one thing. Your ability, or your willingness, I should say, not ability. Your willingness to say, not my will, but yours be done. Man says this. Man says, I believe. Show me God and I'll trust you. That's what we say, which is logic. That's how we deal with each other. I want you to do this. Okay, show me that you're trustworthy and I'll trust you. Like, show me and I'll trust you. Show me and I'll trust you. That's how we approach it. But God says, mm, I don't like it that way. God says, I got good for you. I got peace. I got love. I got joy. I got eye has not seen. I got clarity when you're confused. I got strength when you're weak. I got companionship when you're lonely. I got wisdom when you need it. I got comfort when you're mourning. Like, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. But trust me and I'll show you. See the difference? Which one's you? Man says, show me and I'll trust you. God says, trust me and I'll show you. And it's up to each one of us which of those approaches we're going to take. All life boils down to this. Do you trust God with your life? Whose hands is your life in? Your own? Good luck to you. Or God's? You can be in good shape. As we approach Christmas, let this be our prayer. As we approach Christmas, where Jesus showed us how much he's willing to do for our sake. And he's willing to deny himself. And we see the king of heaven come down to earth in a little baby manger. And we see how much he's willing to do for us. And let that be our motivation to pray and say, God, 2022, 2022, the new year, and the tail end of this year, the final two weeks here and into 2022. It's not my will, but your will. Let this be the year of not me. You know how people say the year of me or the year of whatever? Let this be the year of thy will be done. And all my wants, I take all those. Let's put those in that drawer where no one looks at, the bottom drawer. Okay, we just put it over there. We'll come back to it in 2023. 2022, let it be the year of I want you, your will more than I want mine. Let's stand together and say a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the message that you've given to us. Thank you for the love that you've shown us and your desire to give us the best of the best, satisfaction and, 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 and significance and purpose and meaning in life. Help us, Lord, to take this hard step. It's so simple, but so not easy to do. But we pray that you would give us the strength and the courage to be able to say, not my will be done, but your will in all things. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, with the intercessions and the prayers of all your saints. Hear us as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.